please join me in our spirit music, which is number 42 in your hymnal. Good morning. And welcome to the Universalist Unitarian Church of Farmington. My name is Beverly Church, and I'm part of the uh, Religious Education Committee and also the UUCF Vocal Ensemble. And after the service, you won't want to miss the, uh, the peep show downstairs, which the RE Committee, uh, it's one of our uh, events, and that's where the kids create dioramas made of Easter peeps, so it should be fun. I'd like to extend a special welcome to any visitors we have here today. Please join us in the lower level after the service for coffee hour. Newcomers may enjoy introductory conversations downstairs at the welcome table with our members. I invite any first time visitors, if you're comfortable, to stand and let us know where you're from and how you heard about us. We'd like to meet you. <laughs> During the service, we have supervised nursery for babies and toddlers and religious education classes for children and youth. Please see our religious education coordinator, Natalie Case, for more information. And should you need to leave the service for any reason, there are two other locations in the building where the service is broadcast. An usher can direct you. Our UU principles begin with, a, with our pledge to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people. As we are a welcoming congregation, we welcome into our community people of all races, sexual orientations, belief systems, and ages, including any who are fidgety and create youthful noises. These little humans represent our future and we welcome them fully in the meeting house. Um, at this time, does anyone have an announcement they'd like to make? Good morning. Paul Denowitz, uh, Chair of um, Fundraising. 
And just to give you an update on to our, uh, our pledge drive, uh, we're now at about $153,000, um, well on our way to the goal. We have two more weeks. Um, if you haven't gotten your pledge in yet, please do so. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with somebody that said, well, you know, I don't think I'm going to pledge, but, you know, I drop money in the plate. And understand that the reason for the pledge is to allow us to budget for next year. Uh, the money in the plate is a, is a great thing, but it's certainly n not something that we can count on or not something that we can put into the budget. Um, so please get your pledge in. Uh, we will end the pledge drive on the 28th of this month, and then we will put together a budget and uh, we will uh, see how we come out. But uh, certainly we appreciate all of your thoughts and gifts and uh, time and treasure. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. Are there any other announcements? Are there any other announcements? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> right. Is that better? Okay. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Thank you. Please, <clears throat> excuse me. Please join me in the responsive chalice lighting that's on page two of your order of service. Attention is love. What we must give children, mothers, fathers, pets, our friends, the news and woes of others. 
what we want to change, we curse and then pick up a tool. Eyes and hands and tongue. And if you can't bless it, get ready to make it new. We light our chalice to all that we bless and make new together. Megan? Morning. So um, I'm going to start my meaning of membership discussion with um, a bit of a confession, even though I know we don't really do that kind of thing here. Um, and it's that I came here first for the free child care. <laughs> so, I mean, I, so I, um, I came here, I think, the first time in maybe January of 2014, uh, and I had been living in Michigan for less than six months, uh, and I had a very small person. I, Will was about two at the time, and I didn't really know anybody, and it was January, and nobody could leave the house. Um, and I, I didn't have any family in the area, and I just thought, I, you know, I, I, I saw, you know, UU Church, child care, and I'd been to UU Churches before, and I was positive about them, but it was the child care that really put me over the edge and said, boy, wouldn't it be nice for one hour? <laughs> like, here you go, I'm going to go sit and listen to something that adults have to say. So I did. Um, uh, and you were um, very friendly and welcoming and helpful, and you provided that for me, and I kept coming back. Uh, and I joined about a year later, um, and I, um, I, I the, the best part of joining, I, I really felt like the, the fullest experience of joining was not the day that I signed the book, which was um, a good day, uh, but but when I started to actually get involved in things, so I served on a search committee, uh, I became part of the coach committee, I got involved. And suddenly, um, the uh, friendly people who it was hard to have a conversation with when I was chasing around after this small person, uh, it was much easier to have a conversation with when we were working on something together. So um, if you are relatively new uh, to this congregation, I highly recommend um, getting involved, picking an area that uh, is something that you are interested in and um, picking up with that and and giving it a try because the um, that IKEA effect where you like something more when you've worked on it is true of church as well. Um, so yeah, that was maybe th uh, three years ago now, um, and I've been coming back and I'm happy to see you all on Sundays. Um, and I keep coming back to the fact that you know I'm grateful to you for knowing what I needed on that day in January uh, when I first walked through the door and silently and you know quietly and, and, and helpfully giving that uh, and I hope that I can do the same for you. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. So the membership committee is um, the committee that organizes um, a lot of different things, including having these um, meaning of membership moments um, once a month. I'd like to invite the membership committee chair and the fundraising chair and the social justice chairs, if they're here, and any other um, member here that is here this morning that is in leadership to come front up front and please bring your order of service and help us to lead um, the litany that's listed on page three. So George and Paul and Elizabeth and Julie, Diane, Kevin. I'd like Denise, please. Denise, would you please come up too? Please, thank you. Um, and um, Actually, I'll have Yvonne come up, too, for a second, and I'll tell you why. So Yvonne is coming up right now, and she is on the Social Justice Committee. Paul is on the Fundraising Committee. Kevin is our treasurer of our finance um, chair. And 
Um, Julie Addis is our VP of administration, so she helps with the staff. George, um, what can we say about George? Uh, George is um, chair of the membership committee and the social activities. And Diane is the chair of the program council, Elizabeth Sunday Service. And Marie um, Gephardt is chair of COACH. And Libby is in on the nominating committee. Um, very busy at this time of year. And Yvonne is on social justice. And Denise um, Hurd helps keep track of the care committee. Um, and so if you um, leaders would lead us in the litany and then the congregation will respond. Like people of every age, we celebrate the grandeur of creation. Like people of every age, we echo the ancient call for justice. We are from various backgrounds and of diverse beliefs. Each of us is unique. We stand at the same time apart and alone with differing feelings and insights. Yet we are not entirely alone and separate, for we are the children of the human family and of one human heritage. We are one in the search of life's meaning. We have all known despair and exaltation. All have borne burdens. All have moments of weakness and times of strength. All sing songs of sorrow and of love. This place is a stronghold of hope and inspiration, teaching us the holiness of life and inspiring in us love for all humanity. In this place and during this time together, in the presence of the sacred, may our hearts be purified to worship together in sincerity and truth. And so before you leave, I'd like to just say that we do have a time in the spring that um, acknowledges with a volunteer recognition that's kind of a, an official, we give you maybe a candy bar or a flower. Today we're just giving you the presence and the gift of this presence and we're thanking you. The people that you see up front and there are a few more that aren't here today are the pillars that continue to reach out to you and I am so glad that so many of you are here for this kind of leadership sermon today that is going to connect um, back and forth and again to each one of the um, members represented up here and we thank you for your time. Please join me in reading our unison words of offering as we acknowledge our generosity and intention to continue support and build this welcoming community. We give generously to support this church where love, justice, and equality inspire our acts of service and compassion.
you know that each and every one of you has a perfect heart. You have known joys and burdens, sorrows, challenges, wonderful celebrations. Each of you has come through yet another week of this beautiful Michigan weather that gives us four seasons in one week. <laughs> you are strong and you are resilient. I invite you to come up front if you would like and introduce yourself by first name and share a joy or a sorrow of significance that you would like us to draw our attention to. And it's the location that's in Troy on Crooks. And then they will be having a memorial here um, later in the spring.
I'd like to light this candle for all the joys and the concerns that each of us think about and carry within our hearts and our spirits during the week. Um, this is the kind of congregation that if you haven't met somebody yet during coffee hour, all you have to do is walk up and start chatting and you don't even have to say, hi, how are you? You can just say, aren't these bagels great? Or what has been your challenge this week? And you can go for the deeper questions and you'll make um, a grand um, connection. I'd like to invite us to move into a time of quiet. And if you're comfortable to please close your eyes for a few moments. We share these moments of silence and we focus on diversity because in our circles, some of our friends today will acknowledge this day as Palm Sunday. Our Christian friends have a holy week spread before them. And because some of our friends will celebrate Passover at the week's end, remembering the blight and plagues that passed over the Jewish people long ago. And because some of our friends acknowledge the mythology of spring and know that Persephone will return to Demeter and bring the flowers and the flourishing colors of springtime back with her. Because we are Unitarian Universalist, we acknowledge and respect the beliefs of our friends and our neighbors as they put their faith into practical use, being better people, as we do our best to as well. In our silence, may we give ourselves a gift of peace and quiet and harmony for a few moments. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. When I breathe in, I breathe in peace. When I breathe out, I breathe out love. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite quotes. And this quote was written by someone who um, was part of the Himalayan expedition in the early 1900s, William Hutchinson Murray. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy. And so I'm going to repeat that again with just a little caveat and connect to what Megan shared this morning about how she was excited to have um, a break from her young, energetic son, but then when she got committed, there was no more hesitancy because she felt more a part of the group. So until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back always in effectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from your decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents, 
meetings, and material assistance, which no one could have dreamed would have come their way. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. So living in Michigan for many years and um, most of my life in the Midwest, most of us have driven around the country and seen silos of large farms. They symbolize this nostalgic image of abundance and stages of storing grain for the long haul. For those of you with farming experience, silos move beyond nostalgia and represent a system of storing wheat that requires monitoring and maintenance, measurements of humidity, weight of the grain, calendar and harvest times, and distribution contracts. In other words, we can see a silo and romanticize the down-to-earth life of a farmer, or we can deal with the complexity of what those huge pillars really represent. I'd like to draw an analogy between farm silos and church silos today. Patrick Lincani brought the concept of silos into the leadership conversation with his book called Silos, Politics, and Turf Wars. Silos occur in churches when leaders act like their ministry, their committee, if you will, or their team is the only one that matters. A silo attitude results in that leader or team only supporting or giving or attending to functions that just pertain to them. It can kill a ministry and result in many problems. What problems can be caused by this silo attitude? You can have an unhealthy competition. You know, sometimes, especially when we're talking about budgets, well, you know, it's more important to do this than it is to do this, so we should give more money to this. Some jealousy, well, last year, so-and-so got that, and we didn't get this. This kind of sounds like um, family dynamics as well. Hurt feelings, pride, a lack of trust, fighting over the limited resources, and sometimes foot dragging. And so foot dragging is an interesting concept when you think about it as applied to churches. You know, we have um, visions and goals and missions that we state. And so we state these, and then if we don't touch on them during the year and see where our progress is, or if those goals were too lofty or we really didn't mean that we wanted to grow, you know what a congregation can do? They can create a crisis. They can create a crisis and stir things up over maybe the heat going out or maybe the kinds of hymns that are being sung or maybe why Reverend Leonette always changes the litany. All of those things can be little sparks that can turn into big things. I remember when I caused one the first year that I was here. Remember when I talked about maybe changing the format of joys and concerns? <laughs> so these kind of procedures, if you will, are not overt, they're under the surface. And they can change the dynamics of a congregation from being harmonious to being in conflict. Unitarian Universalists are known to be independent thinkers and believers. Our historical New England connections provide a firm belief of non-reliance on others. In fact, many have a non-reliance on even a higher power, right? We take pride in doing things efficiently and having a unique approach to systems of governance that began with congregational polity, which is the basis of how we relate to one another. If the leadership regularly thinks how their committees work or interest groups impact the entire church, silo thinking can be avoided. So this is one of the great moves that all of you made 
uh, more than eight years ago when you went to having a program council. So the program council's intention is to meet and to share ideas early in their inception so that people can um, chime in with ideas that they might have or refinements. And so um, I'm going to uh, share with you uh, the, the example that was really big last year. A year ago, we were just on the verge of planning to have the parking lot done. So, oh, well, you know, just let's close down the church for a couple months and we'll have the parking lot redone. Okay, how does the administrator get in? How, um, where do we go and meet? Um, what is the impact going to be on those people that um, get confused with directions if we meet in another place? Uh, how long is it going to take? That is all a whole story, not even mentioning the budget of, of the plan, moving the playground up to the uh, top of the hill so that we could have the proper drainage. This wasn't just about a playground, uh, a parking lot. It was about a parking lot, Sunday services, services during the week, our rental property, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so that project had all the threads going through it and connecting to all the committees. Every committee was impacted by the parking lot project. You would be surprised that most every project that you think of is impacted by every other committee. And so if you want to minimize the silos, then the communication and the cross-pollinization of information is very important. So to change that, um, of course, the main topic or the main sermon that we need to remember in our lives is moving from the I to the we. When you listen to the joys and concerns this morning, there's not a joy or concern that just stayed in the I. Bud didn't fix his furnace alone. Mark isn't getting through the weekend or um, the challenges alone. Megan came up and shared that she didn't want to be alone. All of us need to move from the I to the we. All the good ideas that you've had since 1987, they have been very good ideas, and some of them worked, and some of them didn't. And there is somebody brand new in this congregation that's going to give you a different slant or a different perspective on things. What we want to avoid is something that my Italian grandma was very good at. God rest her soul. She had seven children. And the way that she got the attention of the seven children is every time one came to visit, she would stir up a story about some of the other ones. And she would say, well, you know, Josie, she brought me a nightgown last week, and you haven't brought anything. Do you want to see the new nightgown? And she literally had a drawer filled with brand new nightgowns that she wouldn't open because they were too nice to wear. But she would stir this up about nightgowns and foods and etc. I didn't realize that she was um, kind of mimicking an ego factor from Shakespeare in Othel with Othello. Othello and his young Venetian wife were in love. Othello and Desdemona were deeply in love. Othello being a simple-hearted soldier who trusts those around him, and Desdemona loving to listen to his every word. However, Iago, friend of Othello, plays the characters against one another and creates an atmosphere of distrust and separation. He is constantly in his whisper, whispering in Othello's ear, and eventually incites him into violent jealousy, and the story ends in senseless tragedy. That story isn't about my grandmother. That story is, yes, a Shakespeare story, but all of you have so much power. I remember telling this um, to my grandchildren when they were five and nine. 
We have so much power right here. What we say when we get together for our auctions and events, what we say at the women's and men's luncheons, what we say when we have committee work, what we say, oh, don't tell anybody this, but this is what I heard. What we say has a lot of power. And so there's something on the bulletin board downstairs that some of you might have noticed, and it's that think, and I'm not going to be able to remember all of them, so you're going to have to go and have a bagel and look at the bulletin board. But before you speak, is it thoughtful? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? So that is the kind of breakdown that we have here in our congregation as far as what we can do to break down the silos. So to change that culture is obviously adaptable for all of you. It is amazing to me with this congregation how you have been working to break down silos. A couple of weeks ago, I called the Social Justice Committee and asked them um, if we could do a special collection that I had heard about um, from the Farmington community for CARES. You all contributed $500 to help put different food and different um, resources on the shelves for the needy people in Farmington. You've done the backpacks. I invited Denise um, Hurd up because we visit and we send cards to homebound people or people that are going through some challenges or transitions. We even came up with a system about how to handle memorials because it was starting to tax the different people in our community that work full time or are elderly so we can't do the big, big memorial that we used to do. Now it rotates through different committees. And none of the committees balked when they were brought this additional task because it's on a rotation basis. So one committee in April will handle any memorials that came through in April and so on. And so this calls to mind something that you, um, you might be familiar with the story. It's the allegory with the long spoons. It's a parable that shows the difference between heaven and hell by means of people forced to eat with long spoons. It's attributed to Rabbi Haim of Ramashak and other sources. One day a man said to God, God, I'd like to know what heaven and hell are like. So God showed the man two doors. Inside the first one, in the middle of the room, was a large round table with a large pot of stew. It smelled delicious, made the man's mouth water, but the people sitting around the table were thin and sickly. They appeared to be so hungry and famished. They were holding spoons with very long handles, and they found it impossible to get that pot of stew into their own mouths. The man shuddered at the sight of this misery and suffering. God said, you have seen hell. But behind the second door, the room was exactly the same with the large pot of stew and the long-handled spoons. The people had the same challenge, but what were they doing? They were reaching across and feeding one another. And so this is what a church community that's not filled with silos looks like. You not only feed each other with a potluck or with resources uh, that you give during a pledge drive, but you feed each other with information that applies to all of us so that when a particular mulch party is created to get mulch up to the playground isn't the same day that we do a, um, a cleanup party. Oh, here I am. Did you, did you miss me? It was down here. It's good. Th I wasn't a cheerleader, but I still have that voice. So when we look at silos, how can we work foundationally to be clear on how to avoid them? Make sure that we have a shared, clear vision. This is something that we've worked on. We have a wonderful mission statement. Seek answers everywhere. Include 
everyone. So did you all know that your mission statement is on the front of the order of service every week? So if, that's the beginning of your elevator speech, right? So if you have some well-meaning person at your work or um, that you're uh, just a stranger or somebody in your family or next week for Easter and they say, well, what is that Unitarian Universalist Church all about? Everybody. Seek answers everywhere. Include everyone and live with compassion. We made it so short so that you can memorize it or you can have it as a very um, slight tattoo on your forearm. <laughs> that might be a fundraiser for next year. So we have a clear vision. We build trust in all of our leaders. I will tell you the people that stood up here this morning, I have uh, amazing trust with them. If you bring an idea to them, they say, well, how can we do it? And instead of let's not do it. So building trust with your leaders and knowing that they are here and they are as committed to this congregation as I am and as you are. You encourage your leaders to talk to one another. So don't be shy. Sometimes people feel that if you're going to give um, some input, that it's criticism. So let's say, I'm going to pick on Joan for a minute. Um, Joan is planning a birthday party, and she's thought of everything because she's planned parties for years. She's thought of everything. But I said, Joan, did you, did you know a lot of people are, are gluten sensitive now, and so we need gluten-free cupcakes? And she's like, oh, you're right. That doesn't mean that Joan doesn't know how to plan parties. That just means that we're putting one more piece of information into the pot to make it successful for everyone. Remind leaders that it's not about them. They were kind of shy and humble up here this morning, so I think they have that. Teach leaders to step inside of others' shoes. So this is the interesting um, activity that we could possibly do, is that you have a field trip where certain committees go and attend another committee's meeting. And so then you hear all the details that Sunday services and membership and building and grounds have to handle. This is also something, I know that this is, sounds like church leadership talk, but this is also something that you can apply with your own families. The more transparency you have, the more energy that you have, going in and out, the more included, including um, voices, even if you have small children. I remember uh, having family meetings, and the smallest child got to have an opinion and have some input. I was a single mom at the time, even on how we spent our social, on, on our tax refund. Um, so we came up with some interesting talks about, well, we could spend $250 at Taco Bell, and then we could finally get a drink, because I would never let them get a drink. So those are all the ways that you can minimize silo thinking by including all the voices. So these are some questions that I would like to close with that we could ask our committees and one another. What is one thing you wish every other ministry understood about what you do? What are some of the things that we do that create stress for you and your team? I think I'm going to bring these up to the program council. What is one thing you are really excited about right now? And if there isn't something that you're excited right, about right now, we have to think of something. We have to throw something out into the next six weeks and decide what that is. But I will tell you, next week's Easter, and there's going to be a surprise. And the week after that, there's going to be Maypole. So those are for just the next two weeks. What would, could we do on a committee to make the other committee's life easier? These field trips can build relationships and trust. So to keep what we have is wonderful and to grow 
transparency, conversations, and continue to not be so sensitive to think that somebody's criticizing you if you're giving um, information is something that we all can consider. And so hopefully after this sermon, you'll have to hear at committee meetings much less from Reverend Leonetta saying, well, we don't want to be a silo church, right? And you'll know why. Jeff Saris says, that which is arises, allow to arise. The anger is to find it to be interesting. So if you follow it or sentimentalize it, then if you exaggerate it and expand on it or identify with it, any of those and all of those, you are adding something to it. The longer and more fully we can meet and experience, the more dynamism begins to take over. The unfolding is organic. So we're going to close with doing something organic. Each of you was given a pipe cleaner. So this is going to be a multitask thing. First, I'd like you to turn to page 6 and take your order of service and fold it. Because we're going to, rather than having silos, we're going to create a weaving. And so some of the leaders that are around you are going to reach out to you, or you can just reach out to somebody else. And I want you to weave together in a creative way or just a simple, secure way your pipe cleaner with somebody else to represent the way that you're going to weave information and energy and resources through the congregation. And at the same time, pat your head, rub your belly. At the same time, we're going to sing Song of Community, the first, third, and fifth verse. First, third, and fifth. All odd numbers. So you're clear. Make your weaving and sing, because the weaving's not going to take that long. So stand as you are willing and able. Weave away and sing away. <coughs> we'll weave a love that green sure is spring. Deepens in summer to fall, autumn brings and winter to spiral again. <coughs> My friends will weave on.
Each of you has the capacity to weave, not only here at church, but within your families and your communities. Be the Unitarian Universalist that you know that you can be, affirm and promote each other with joy and understanding. Be curious about one another and know that you can live with compassion and still ask lots of questions and create a weaving as well as singing at the same time. Have a great week. Thanks for letting me pick on you. We'll have gluten-free yeah. cupcakes. <laughs>